Well, good morning, Life Co. Good to see all your shining, bright faces here in this spring that feels like winter, and winter felt like spring, right? But um, my name is Lenny. I'm one of the staff pastors here. I have the privilege and the honor to bring the word of the Lord to you this morning and going into this afternoon. I promise not to be too long. But I believe in this psalm series, um, it's been wonderful. But what's more wonderful than our psalm series is this Lent challenge that we're all in. And 40 days, I said to Pastor Kyle, I said, it's like we're giving a tithe of the year to the Lord, right? And then some, right? A little bit more than three, 36 and a half days, we're giving him 40 days And it's just a wonderful thing to see what God is doing in this church. And it's like not a new program. It's not a new worship team. It's not a new this or a new that. It is your hearts before the Lord are changing. God is bringing good change to us. You know, and we are the church. And when you're having a revival yourself, And then you come into the house of God, and we all come into the house of God together. That's when things start to happen in our midst. How many of you feel like our worship experience has just been increasing week after week? You know, and like we could say, well, thank you to this one or thank you to that one. Yes, thank you to them because they're being obedient to uh, following the Lord in their gifting. But what's so wonderful, it's just like God is doing it. God, no one gets the glory here. God gets all the glory. So um, I want to bring to you a message from Psalm 103. It's my favorite psalm. Pastor Kyle went around the, the, the pastoral staff and he said, what's your favorite psalm? I said, Psalm 103. He said, okay, you're preaching it. I said, okay, I'll do it. So thank you, Pastor Kyle. But before we get into the message, I have one more announcement. This Lent challenge has done so good that we're going to continue with a non-Lent challenge or a non-Lent Bible reading plan that in the non-Lent time of year, which is the rest of the year, circle all the way around till next Lent season, we're going to go through the Bible in one year. So there's a QR code behind me and you have to, you know, sign up for it because It's going to be six days a week, no Sundays, six days a week, and it's going to be starting the day after Easter, we're going to all be going through the entire Bible. Well, you might say, well, that's an awful lot of reading in 288 days. Well, it is, but you know, the Bible says that he shall not, his word shall not return unto him void, right? It'll accomplish that for which it is sent. So even when we just peruse it and we get exposed to it and we see the character and the nature of God in the Old Testament and we read through these things like, oh, God, Leviticus, how long is this going to take to get through Leviticus, right? But there's everything has a purpose. God has a purpose in all of his word. And the longer you are in the word and the longer you study the word and the longer you read the word, the more benefit starts to come through into your own heart and into your own life. It's just wonderful what God will do. It's like there's a transformation that takes place. Romans 12.1, therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right? So the word of God renews our mind. Well, I was thinking this way, but when I read the word of God, I see what God says about this. And then we begin to start to replace the things that were wrong or the lies that we've been believing with the truth. And that's where the truth starts to set us free. And we come back into the house of God and we're more free this week than we were last week. And God just moves and moves and moves and moves in our hearts and in our lives. It's a wonderful thing. So will you sign up for that? We're all going to sign up for that. It's going to be a great thing. You're going you're gonna to get notifications and you're going to get encouragements along the way. So I'm, we're going we're gonna to talk about Psalm 103 today. It is my favorite and I believe God 
is going to speak to you today. I want you all to stand with me. We're going to read this psalm together. And when we read it, don't just read it like words. Read it like you're taking it into your heart. It's like you're eating the scroll, so to speak. You're taking in those words into your heart. Can we just pray a quick prayer? Say, Holy Spirit, reveal your word to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? Here we go. A Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Amen. Are you feeling it? You may be seated. Some scholars believe that David wrote Psalm 103 later on in his life. I would like to believe that because... In, later on in Psalm 103, we only read the first 12 verses, but later on in Psalm 103, he talks about the frailty of life. It's like a wind that blows over the grass, and it's here one day and gone the next. So, so my point is that David, through everything that he went through, his ups and his downs, his good times and his bad times, his defeats and his victories, everything that he went through, he still ends up with a praise on his lips. I think sometimes our praise is so conditional. We're having a good day or we're having a good week or we were good this week. And so we come to, to God's house and we're ready to praise. But listen, God says, bless the Lord. Come anyway, come to praise him. Listen, with everything that David went through, he still found a reason to praise God. Didn't he? And we need to find the Lord in worship. We need to find the Lord in blessing him and praising his name. As modern day Christians, we are looking for the Lord too many times to bless us. We want to be blessed. But God shows us it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to give him praise than, or to bless the Lord than for us to be blessed. So it's like we're giving back to God what he gives us. Ephesians 1.3 summarizes it this way. He says, blessed or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Sounds like a good summary that God is blessed and he does bless us. The word bless here is to bow before or to kneel down. It is a posture of humility. It is a position of worship. It is an attitude of thanksgiving. It is a spirit of praise. It is a desire to give God the glory. So here's my first point. Praise changes the atmosphere. Praise changes the atmosphere. I don't know about you, but there was an atmospheric shift this morning when we were worshiping God. There was something that was happening in the heavenlies, and it came down to earth and touched each and every one of us. There's no denying it. Somebody with an experience is never at the mercy of somebody with an argument, right? We touched God, and God touched us this morning in worship. Yes, he's very present. 
But um, I just want to share a story with you. So about changing the atmosphere. Every family get-together that we have or every birthday get-together, we have like 17 in our family now. It keeps growing. My, my new baby, Sonny Leonard, his name is, was born on March 12th. Amy and Greg's baby, and he is coming to church for the first time next week on Easter Sunday. We're so excited. Number 17. But so wonderful, so, so, so wonderful. But every time we get together for birthdays, we always try to highlight the person whose birthday it is. And we go around the table and we say what we love about that person. You should really try this sometime. As soon as the first part, okay, I want to go first. I love Jerry because, right, or I love John because, or I love Brittany because. And as soon as the first person starts, people are starting to laugh, people are starting to cry. The person receiving is really crying. (laughs) Because we take the time to say what is true. And that's what it's like. It's not natural for us to come into the house of God or even in our own personal time and just start to praise God. It's easy to complain. It's easier to to murmur, right? Um, But when we get together, it just changes the whole room. The atmosphere changes. I remember this one time, Jerry and I, you know, now that we're empty nesters, we, um, we go on like car trips every day to Wawa. And um, I get my coffee and she gets her tea so I stay awake with her at night and not fall asleep in front of the TV. But um, we, we take some car trips together. But we were going away for a little while and we were in the car. I was like, hey, can we play that game, um, what we love about each other? I said, I'll go first. So I started to tell Jerry, I love your long brown hair and your brown eyes and your black eyelashes with Maybelline Very Black, um, which I've been buying for 45 years for you. And um, I love how you care about people. I love how you have compassion, especially on our children, how you care about the atmosphere in our home. I I, I love everything about you. And like, she starts to look at me different and I'm like, ooh, this is gonna be a good trip to Wawa. Let me good trip. And said, okay, now you go. I'm like driving. I'm like. She said, skip. You go again. (laughs) I'm just joking. She said. (laughs) She did say a few things nice about me. We had a good trip. But when we bless the Lord, when we praise the Lord Jesus, then something begins to happen. When we gather together and we worship together, there's a shift in the atmosphere. His presence shows up. It's like he comes to the party that he's invited to, where it's his birthday, so to speak. And we begin to tell him who he is. We begin to worship him for, for, for what he's done. We don't pray, oh, God, bless me. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for your power, for your, for, for, your, for your presence, Lord. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you'd never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. And so we begin to just worship the Lord. And, and we begin to highlight all he's done for us. And when we start to tell him the truth of how wonderful and marvelous and majesty he is, things start to happen. Hearts start to open up. Healing starts to flow. Miracles begin to break out. As the praises go up, the glory starts to come down. His presence becomes tangible. And we find ourselves in this place of faith where suddenly the mountains become molehills and what's so dark becomes light and God just begins to move and things start to happen because now we see through his eyes. Our sorrow becomes joy and our ashes become beauty and our inabilities become his abilities. Right? Isaiah 40, 29 says he gives power to the weak 
and strength to the powerless. There's like a great exchange that takes place because praise is like true surrender. Right? I, I'm making a fool out of myself every Sunday morning. Am I trying to make a fool out of myself? No. But I don't care what people think. I've come to worship the Lord. I've come to praise the Lord when I get into the house of God. That's why I'm here. Well, I'm just here to see what the Lord's going to say to me. No, I'm here to bless him. I'm here to tell him something. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Okay, here's my second point. Cruising through this message, praise wins the battle. David was speaking to his own soul when he said, bless the Lord, O my soul. He was talking to himself. He was encouraging himself, saying, soul, bless the Lord. I don't care what kind of day you had, what kind of week you had, bless him anyhow. Come on, old school people used to say, praise him anyhow. Hallelujah anyhow. That's a good saying, hallelujah anyhow. Regardless of what David was going through, he learned to remember the good, even in the midst of bad circumstances. In our human nature, it's easier for us to complain than to focus on the positive. We focus on the negative. According to the National Science Foundation, 80% of our thoughts are negative, and 95% of our thoughts are repetitive. So when you take the product of those two percentages, that means that 76% over three quarters of your everyday thoughts are repeating themselves. They're negative and they're repeating themselves through your mind. And everybody was just saying, that's true. That's true. It's like your mind's got this thing on repeat, what this person did to me, what I'm going through. Will it ever end? Why can't I do this? Why can't I overcome this? Right, these negative thoughts are, are running through your head and it's like they become like ruts in the ground that it's easy for us to like slip right back into that rut again. You know, when you're on an on a open land and there's tire, tire tracks and you try to ride outside the tire tracks, it's so easy for your car to fall right back into the sunken down tire tracks, the ruts, and that's what begins to happen. And those ruts, those mindsets, those ways of thinking, those negative patterns replaying themselves in our minds over and over again become like the thing that we fall into so easily and become defeated. It's so easy for us to be defeated because we've got these negative things. Somebody said, I've got it on repeat in my mind, but then there's other people that say, you know what? I've got this worship song on repeat on my, on my, on my whatever it is called on YouTube or whatever it is. I got it on repeat and it's playing over. You know, maybe some of you need to do that. Put some worship on repeat into your mind rather than allowing those thoughts to replay themselves over and over again. How many know the mind is a battlefield? For all of us, the mind is a battlefield. The greatest barrier to true praise is in our minds. We get thinking about stuff and we keep thinking about it over and over all day long. And I don't know where those thoughts come from. Maybe it comes from your childhood. Maybe it comes from something that somebody said to you a long time ago or maybe even last week. Maybe it's just your own mind that goes places that it shouldn't go. Or maybe you're looking upon something that you shouldn't look upon and it's causing these images in your mind that keep repeating themselves over and over again. And then Sunday morning comes and you try to come to the house of God. You're like, well, I'm not really feeling that good today. I don't think I'm going to be able to come. That's because you'd rather sit in a corner and sulk in your misery than come to the, to the house of God and say, I'm going to bless the Lord anyhow. I might have blown it this week, but God is a God who forgives all of my iniquities. I'm not going to forget all his benefits. The mind is a battlefield. I was thinking about the story of David when he took down Goliath. And I looked up what the name Goliath means. The name Goliath means to go into exile or to be held captive. Doesn't our mind do that to ourselves? We become fixated on the thing that's so prevalent in our thoughts 
It's like we can't get it out of our minds. Right? We, and then we go into exile. I'm going to go hide away for a little while. Because it's easier than just not to see anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm of no good in the church because I'm just so defeated myself. I can't seem to overcome myself. How can I help somebody else overcome? And one lie builds upon another lie upon another lie. It speaks to the giants in our minds, in our lives. But I love the story of David. David ran to the field. He ran into the battlefield to face Goliath. He didn't say, well, maybe I'll try to take down the giant. No, he ran to him, chose five smooth stones from the brook. Five. Is there a spiritual significance there? No. But I just believe David was like, if I don't get him with the first stone, I'm going to get him with the second. If I don't get him with the second, I'm going to get him with the third. If I don't get him with the third stone, I'll get him with the fourth stone. And if I don't get him with the fourth stone, I'm certainly going to get him with the fifth. But with the very first stone, he hurled that stone through his slingshot and it zeroed in on radar from God right to the forehead, right between the eyes of Goliath and took him down. And I feel like it's a type of the mind that needs these strongholds that are in our mind need to be demolished. They need to be dismantled. These things that, that, that occupy us and, and, and paralyze us and keep us back from our full potential in God. They need to be destroyed. That giant no more being held captive. My Bible says take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. Listen, when we get these thoughts in our heads, we need, to, we need to assess them. Is this a thought from God or is this a thought from myself? Is this a thought from God or is this a thought from the devil himself? And we need to take those thoughts and if they're bad negative thoughts, you need to grab them and put them in prison. Help, t take them captive. And for the good thoughts that are coming about God's promises and what God desires to do and the goodness of God and the mercy of God and the greatness of God and the compassion of God, you need to release those thoughts. Come on, you need to release those thoughts and tell the Lord about it and tell somebody else about it and then you're going to bring freedom to somebody else's life and you're going to start to see those things, those negative things diminishing over and over again, more and more and more in your life. I'm talking from experience. Hallelujah. Wrong mindsets, belief systems, embracing lies, bad thought patterns, voices vying for our attention, discouragement, fear, despair, depression, hopelessness. The biggest giant is in our minds, overwhelming fears and negative thoughts that paralyze us, render us useless in every aspect of life. These thoughts can hold us captive and send us into exile, but they can also be the gateway to other sins. Well, I blew it anyway. I might as well just binge on some other stuff too. I know I'm not talking anyone's language. Amen? Amen? But it's good news today. It's good news today. That's why David said to his own soul, which includes the mind, bless the Lord. No matter what kinds of thoughts you have, put them down for a moment and begin to bless God. Like Pastor Edder said, can we just take five seconds and begin to praise God? Can I, can I just stop thinking about this for one moment and begin to bless God and believe that God is going to demolish this thing in my life and believe that I, can, that I can overcome in this area, in this battle, in this, this area that I'm defeated over and over again? Yes. Here's my next point. True praise is not circumstantial. It's not based on your circumstances. David was a man who learned how to praise the Lord regardless of the circumstances. You know, it's say, oh, David, you know, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. David, yeah, he was the king. He had things handed to him. You know, he had a good life. He had a lot of riches. Yeah, he did. 
But David was not without trouble, as you know. I find it so interesting how God said, he's a man after my own heart. But yet he made so many mistakes. He did so many things like way worse than you and I might do. But yet God called him a man after his own heart. Why? Because David recognized who he was compared to who God was. He understood, I can't do this. When he, when he sinned with Bathsheba, like Pastor Edder preached a couple weeks ago, he said, Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned and done this grievous thing in your sight. Right? Cleanse me, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Right? David prayed these prayers, even though he blew it. He prayed these prayers, and God, he knew how to get back on track. But if you look at the history of David's life, you might say he's got He's got good reason not to praise, but yet he did. David understood what it was like to be criticized and judged by people close to him, like when his older brother criticized him for wanting to take on Goliath. Remember David, the, the ruddy little shepherd boy was out in the field, the eighth son of David, and when the, when the prophet came, he said, don't you have any more sons than these seven? And, and Jesse said, I got one more runt in the, in the field taking care of the sheep. Call him in. And he called him in. He said, God said, that's your man. He poured the oil over his head. This is the next king of Israel. But then Goliath shows up on the scene, and I'm, I'm sure there was jealousy amongst the seven brothers toward David. Goliath shows up on the scene, and Eliab, the, one of his older brothers, says to David, what are you trying to do, man? Who do you think you are? You're just a shepherd boy. Go back to your sheep, your smelly sheep. Go back to him. That's where you belong, in the sheepfold. You know, there's something about family when family starts criticizing, especially older siblings. Don't get me started. Don't get me started with my uh, sibling. I won't even say what gender he is. I mean... I mean, I hope Billy ain't listening to this message. No, I love, I love my brother dearly. I really do. But like, you know, he, he tries to take the place of my dad and tries to tell me like, you know, when I'm, I see when I'm like 12 and he's 14 and he tries to tell me what to do. You know, I get it, but I'm 62 and he's 64. Like, stop telling me what to do. <laughs> But it hurts when it comes from family, right? I mean, Jesus could do no miracles in his own hometown because of their unbelief. Is this a carpenter's son? You know, this is Jesus. You know, he's just a natural man. He's just the son of the carpenter. You know, there's nothing special about him. They did not recognize him as the son of God. And so Jesus could do no miracles there. It's the same thing, man. It hurts when it comes from family. Can somebody say Amen. But David knew that thought. He knew that feeling. David understood what it was like to be the target of someone else's jealousy when King Saul was coming after him to kill him because he's going to be raised up to be the next king. David knew what it was like to be betrayed even by his own son Absalom, betrayed by your own blood. Man, David, you don't got, man, you got, you, you don't got no reason to praise Jesus. Right? David knew his own shame from committing a series of sins in the whole Bathsheba scandal. As was published by the National Enquirer of that day. <laughs> King found in bedroom with woman Bathsheba. We learned a lot about that from Edder's message on Psalm 51. David knew the sorrow of losing a family member to death when his son died. How can I praise the Lord when everything's going wrong? Come on, church. David knew the guilt of ending up on the enemy's side because of fear when he went into the camp of the Philistines. David, But David knew um, uh, beyond transcending all these things that might not be reason for him to praise the Lord, 
David transcend all these? Because he knew the secret to get himself back on track. And that was to encourage himself in the Lord his God. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, mind, will, and emotions. Get on track with God. Get in the program. Start to believe God. Start to look back on your track record and where you've been and how you saw God move and how he defeated the lion and the bear and God through you took down Goliath. Come on, start to remember what God has done, how he's strong in you and you don't have to be strong. God is moving and God is doing things through you and has done things. What he's done before, he'll do it again. And listen, God's getting ready to do it again in your life. You might look back and you might be in that in-between place from, from where you were and when God did miracles in your life and you had this great encounter with God to where you believe where you are right now and now God wants you to align your faith with where you've been with God's faithfulness knowing that he's going to bring you all the way through to the other side. Yes, give God praise. Pastor John John spoke on this last Last Sunday, when David came back to his hometown, him and his mighty men and the city where they lived was burnt to the ground. Their wives and their children were taken captive. All their possessions were stolen. And David, and then his men started to conspire to kill David himself, their leader. Talk about having a bad day. And we're like, so-and-so didn't like my post, and so I can't go to church. <laughs> David encouraged himself. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David, but David encouraged himself. In the Lord his God. David learned the secret of getting back. When he remembered how the Lord had delivered him out of so many things, he encouraged himself. That's why in Psalm 103 he says, forget not his benefits. He forgives all your sins. He heals all your diseases, church. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with loving kindness. He satisfies us with good things. He brings justice to the oppressed. He is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger. He does not punish us according to our sins. He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And what a beautiful picture that is of Christ on the cross carrying your sins. He nailed our sins to the cross as far, and he, and he forgot them, and he removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. Come on, church. Christ has paid the price for our sin. We have reason. If we can't find anything else to praise him, we need to praise him for his salvation. We need to praise him for what he's done for us on the cross. Come on, we're coming into Good Friday this week where we really can think about all that Christ has done. Every week in communion we talk about remember the Lord and what he has done. Why? Because what a price he paid for you and for me. And that'll, that we ought to... We we ought to do communion before we do worship so we can remember what the Lord has done. And if I've got nothing else to praise him for, I'm going to praise him that I've got eternity in heaven waiting for me because of what Christ has done. Here's my last point. Genuine praise comes from all that's in us. God wants it all. He doesn't want a half a heart. He wants your whole heart. Are you with me? Yes. Time and time again in, in the book of Psalms, praise the Lord, David said, with, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Proverbs, trust in the Lord with, come on, let's get with the program. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all. All right, when I sing, though, you say all. Ready? <laughs> Greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength. 
You did good. Trust in the Lord with all. He wants your whole heart. That's why David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Remember the story of the man that brought his son who had a mute spirit to the disciples and the disciples couldn't cast out the spirit, right? And then the man brings his son to Jesus. I brought my son to your, to your disciples, but they could not cast it out. He has a mute spirit and the, he, he, sometimes it throws him into the fire and it throws him into the water and bad things happen. Jesus said, how long has this been going on? Since he's a child. Since he's a child. We have things that are long-term things that are still not resolved in our lives. And we look at that and we say, it just must mean that this is just my cross to bear or this is my thorn in the flesh, or right? We, we, we justify it somehow. But listen, God can turn anything around in a moment. God can change. Come on, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Come on, this man that brought his demon-possessed son since childhood. It must, he must have been like older, probably a, probably a teenager at this point. Brings him to Jesus. And look at what it says in Mark 9, 22. And often he has thrown him both into the fire, Jesus, and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said back to him, if you can. If you can believe all things are possible, to him, for him, to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Here's my point. We all have two sides of ourselves, the believing side and the unbelieving side, the faith side and the doubting side. Don't we? The rest of you are not honest. We all face things that sometimes like, God, can you really do this? I don't know if you could do this. We all go through things in life that kind of are impossible. But how many know that he's the God of the impossible? That's the God we serve. That's, he's like, okay, this is good. Right up my alley. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to do it. We have, the, so, so we are asking God to increase our faith side here. He's like, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help me not to focus on the fact that my son has been in this condition since he's a child. And that's all I've been living with for a, a long, long time. Lord, change the way that I think. Do something. Have compassion on us. Do something. And we know how the story ends that Jesus does deliver the child from this demon and gives him back to the father. But we all have this, and we've got to choose to believe God's word over, come on, over our unbelieving side. We've got to choose to believe. God, I'm going to choose to believe what your word says over what I'm feeling. I'm going to choose to believe what, what it looks like what, what, what your word says and what I feel like or what it looks like in the natural. This is the life of a Christian. For the just shall live by faith. For we live by faith and not by sight. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's why we can come to the house of God and we can praise him when everything's going wrong because it, 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 it just explodes our faith in God who's able to change any situation around, who's able to turn anything around for us when we believe, right? So we want to push down the negative side and we want to elevate the faith side. 
So we want to get fed the word of God. We want the word to come in, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So we come to church to hear the word. Sometimes we come to church, we're so defeated. We're, we're weighed down with the things of this world. We're like, we're like downtrodden and we're, we're depressed and we're down. And God says, I've given you a spirit of praise, a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So don't let this thing weigh you down. Throw it off. Throw it off and receive a garment of praise and begin to lift your hands and worship him. God, I praise you, God. Your word says that you can do the impossible. Your word says that you can turn a situation around. Your word says, God, that I, that I, can, I can stand upon your word today. Come on, church. What's the highest praise? The highest praise is the deepest praise when he has your whole heart. When you come and you bring him everything, that's why David was a man after God's own heart, because he brought him everything. My failures, my, my insecurities, my weaknesses, my struggles, I give it all to you, God. You're able to turn it around. You're able to, when I do this great exchange, you're able to turn my sorrow into joy. Amen. You're able to turn my sadness into laughter again. You're able to redeem me and bring me back from the dead. God, I believe, is at work right now in this church. I believe that over this Lent season, and I believe it's going to continue on, there, there's, a, there's a vulnerability that's taken place. You know, we don't have some big program or bounce houses, even though we like to do that stuff too, but we don't have gimmicks to try to get people to come. God is drawing people because it's real. What's happening in this church is real. And God is revolutionizing our worship because you're having your own personal revival at home. And then when you come to the house of God, me, I got a revival going on. You got a revival going on. You got a revival going on. And there's hundreds of people in the house that have a revival going on in their own home. And we come into the house of God and we've got worship that's exploding. Why? Not because we've got a great worship team, which we do. Not because we got new singers, which we do. It's because your heart is vulnerable and open and ready to worship and bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Come on, God's worthy, isn't he? Come on, one more time, give him praise in the house. One more time, isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Praise the Lord Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this great church. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. Thank you, God, that there's no barrier to keep us back any longer. God, you want us to bring our whole self to you. And we do that even right now, God. Today, next week, and the week after, we come as we are. And we say, Lord, like David said, Lord, I give it to you. God, I give it to you. You're the one that can turn my situation around. I give you praise. I trust in you with all of my heart. I put my faith in you and in your power, not in my power, but in yours. I thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. And God, I pray for this church, this great church. I pray every heart, every life, every marriage, every family member, every person that's here, God, that you would continue to work in the midst of us. My God, my God, what a revival is taking place in the hearts of people at Life Co. A company of believers filled with the life of God, the working, moving power of the Holy Spirit working in every one of them. Thank you for revolutionizing our worship. Jesus, we praise you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. amen.